Okay, folks. Now it's official. Now it's official. I think we should now, probably now you have go to do in. everything right. <laughs> I'm not the best for that. I'm glad you're all here. Thank you. Um, I'm Christopher Davis. I am the technical services specialist at Lincoln County Library District in on the coast of Oregon. And I I love it. It's great. Uh, happy to be here. George asked for volunteers to host the, or to chair the meeting today. And I, I guess I was the only one who volunteered. So you're stuck with me. I'm sorry. Um, the other thing is he is happily up. Well, hopefully happily up in Montreal uh, at the Koha Khan. Uh, I put that in the agenda that uh, that's going on this week as far as announcements, but I don't really have any other topics or anything that were uh, sent to me, uh, nor that George give to me. So um, he said, typically we, you know, show up and ask questions and answer each other's questions and things like that. Sounds like a lot of uh, Koha U.S. meetings I've been to um, for the SIGs anyway. But uh, happy to be here. So we've got Christopher Brandon, Brandon, excuse me, I'm sorry, and Michelle and Clams. Is it Chanel Wheeler? Yes, it is. Okay. And then another person, I can only see your picture. I cannot see your name. Um, would you introduce yourself? Is that okay? Hi, I'm Juliet. I'm uh, at the Rapid City Public Library in South Dakota. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Juliet. Glad you're here. Chris, Lincoln County. Are they on Koha? They are. Yep. Well, well here's the deal. Um, <clears throat> they... I work for the library district, which means I, I'm sort of like the state library, but on a county level. Okay. And uh, so we don't have any libraries ourselves, but we support clients um, with Koha. Uh, we have five libraries right now. We're onboarding three more. Um, so back in the day, um, all of Lincoln County was on Cersei Dynex Symphony, I think, or Cersei Dynex of some sort, and they split apart. There was a schism, just like the dark crystal. Just kidding. Um, and uh, they split off and we kept going. Eventually we moved over to Koha. Their contract was up and um, with uh, they, they went on Triple I, um, Sierra, and their contract is up and they wanted to come on board. And so we're migrating them over um, presently. Uh, they'll be go, their go live, our go live date for the Ocean Books Library Consortium, which is uh, Newport. Lincoln City and uh, Tillamook County, uh, they uh, their go live date is in next spring. Wow, yeah. So is so Driftwood isn't part of your group. Driftwood is, and that's oh, Lincoln is. City. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah i I have a um, a lanyard that I picked up from there in my last visit to <laughs> Lincoln City uh, this year, and and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think they were on Koha though. They're not. And they're they're the ones who are they're they and two other library systems are are uh, migrating on to Koha. Okay. Yeah. Right now they're on Sierra. Very cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right on. Were you there this summer? Yeah. Oh, cool. Man. Yeah, awesome. I always make a point to stop in the library to see what what's going on. <laughs> Do you know Kirsten? Library. I don't director? know anybody personally. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a nice library. I yeah. library, a little different because it's uh you know situated in, in the second floor of a big building yeah well, not really big but but it's pretty cool yeah so if any of you have a chance to come out to the northern oregon coast look me up i'll give you a tour or something <laughs> take you out to lunch So you have the ideal job because I would love to work in a Koha library on the coast. <laughs> I see what you're saying. <laughs> the truth truth be told, I actually it really said it's expensive and I commute into um Newport. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. My wife and I live in Salem, which is about wow. an hour and forty minutes um uh, outside of, you know. Do that is a bit of a commute. <laughs> it is. Wow. It is. But it, it, it goes by quick. You know, you get some music or podcast or book or something like that. And it goes quick, but it's cheaper than renting a place in 
Newport, if you can believe it. It's pretty expensive there. So, yeah. So, all right. Any questions for uh, the meeting today? I can. I have something sort of consortial. Well, I don't know. We're, our consortium is uh, onboarding with uh, Aspen. Mm -hmm. okay. I love Aspen. But uh, we just found a hiccup that we're trying to to work through um, okay. with the self-registration, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, are any of you working with Aspen? We, we do that. We're also migrating to Aspen and, but go ahead, Michelle. Uh, well, so um, the hiccup that we're running into um, as I've been testing, um, so you can use Aspen's self-registration form or you can uh, redirect to your, your old uh, uh, classic uh, Koha uh, self-registration form. I don't want to redirect people to the old uh, self-registration because then it puts them in the old system and kind of is confusing. And so I, I want to use the, the uh, uh, Aspen mm -hmm. form but um, a couple of things I ran into, well, okay. The, the instructions say that you have to have um, the card number auto numbering turned on, which mm. uh, in, in Koha, which we don't want. Um, but then support was saying, no, you don't have to have that turned on. So there's a little bit of confliction in the, the instructions. Um, the second thing that I ran into is we had a couple of mandatory, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Let me see here. I'll pull it up. Um, mandatory fields. Uh, there were mandatory, what was it? Just had to work through these hurdles. Um, they're mandatory attributes, uh, patron attributes. Oh, okay. So we had some custom fields. Uh, mm -hmm. We had some mandatory uh, fields, but we don't require them in self-registration, but Aspen picks up uh, the fact that they're mandatory and won't let you proceed. Uh, so, you know, when you're editing a patron, yes, they are mandatory, but when we self-register, they're not going to know how to answer those questions. So they're not they're not part of the self-registration part, mm. um, but Aspen's getting tripped up on that. So yeah, we've had yeah. Uh, Lucas had to actually turn those mandatory settings off on those, and then write some jQuery to make them uh, required when editing. Oh, okay. So I gotcha. There was a workaround on that. So there's that. Then Aspen, you know, does all the same lingo that we have with with Koha. Uh, and says that you're going to be sent an email uh, uh, to validate uh, your email address, which mm -hmm. it doesn't do. Um, Aspen doesn't do the, the email validation that Koha does. So, But it's uh, saying that because Koha says that, and it's just getting what Koha says. Yes. And so I was sitting there waiting, like, it's not coming through. Um, mm -hmm. So um, now... It looks like um, the only thing that we can do is have Aspen send a, a welcome message. I guess it doesn't it doesn't send this it doesn't trigger the message that's built into Koha, which is interesting. And, so, and are these are these test um, test subjects that you're using test accounts? Yeah. Um, and you checked on the accounts in Koha and, and the, the notifications are blank, right? There, there's no notifications mm -hmm. that are sent. Okay. So, so to be able to send email from Koha, you have to have some uh, alter your DKIM settings. Have you done that? No. 
because exactly what you describe is what will happen if so it, it's a matter of um it's google google has forced this upon us and um you have to the spf record you have to modify it and add these special dkim strings which you can get from bywater mm. so i would approach it from the perspective of we're trying to reset the password and it's not sending an email because that sounds like that's the core of the problem and well, they, yeah I, it sounds more like right now just our welcome message isn't set up uh in aspen um so that part of it uh i know is a hurdle oh, i would okay. imagine that bywater would have would have uh addressed any um email server issues but if they didn't for us we went live three months ago and they didn't for us i had to discover it and then start asking questions mm. Fun. okay well i will have to make note to although since you since you were brought on you know many years ago maybe maybe they were more on top of that then i don't know um and the other thing about having auto-generated IDs, you do have to have that on. And it's going to find the largest barcode number you have and start incrementing that. Yeah, and uh, support told me, uh, we told them we don't want the auto number uh, turned on and they said we don't have to, so. Um, I would it, I wish we didn't have to. <laughs> but yeah, if we if we turn it on, it's gonna start issuing random or you know, these random numbers uh that could conflict with the actual cards. Yeah. We don't issue cards based on what Koha says. We issue cards based on what we have in hand. Right. Right. Well so well one thing one thing to consider is that it will give them a card number. And then they have to go into the library, probably, I presume they have to come into the library and get a physical card anyway, right. which you then replace that card number that was generated with the actual card. Right. But what you're saying is in the interim, before they do that, it could conflict with a card number that you give out to a patron who comes into the library. Is that is that correct? It, it could. Um, if If there is a number that's issued in the meantime, um so, well if they have a, if they have a card if they have a if they're issued that that card number and then somebody tries to issue that card the actual physical card to somebody they're going to get a conflict saying well this is already issued to somebody um yeah. so you know there's that conflict so it's kind of screw it, it it'll kind of screw with our our workflow if we have to throw in uh these dummy numbers it's going to mess up things with cards and it's going to mess up um the workflow normally right now you know we have that self-registration it goes to a self-registration category but it also doesn't have a card number um and so staff will know oh there's no card number i'm going to put it you know i have to issue you know that card if they see a card number there that's going to trip them up and so that's you know it's it, kind of I, a I, so here's what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. You need to create a, well, first off, hopefully your libraries have prefixes that are unique to each library or library district, depending on what sort of consortium you are. Um, but it, find the largest number you have, create a dummy record with a larger number, say using a prefix, you know, like 9999, um, and then have it that way, it'll auto increment from that number did try that and from what i could tell in the testing it wasn't it wasn't going off of that number so i'll have to, I'll have to do some more testing i hadn't had any success with that but um there so yeah um there, there's a little there there are some bumps that we have to work through and and, and workflow issues especially you know the difference between Koha and Aspen uh, self-registration. That's going to be a, a relearning process for staff, for sure. But uh, also, you know, we, um, I guess the the communication from Aspen is different 
than with Koha and also that it doesn't validate the email addresses. That's going to be annoying because we already have a lot of emails that bounce because staff can't enter emails in correctly, apparently. And there's no validation when entering those email addresses. Um, I have a ticket out there for uh, the ability to add um, a third party email validator that will check it when it's entered in, uh, uh, in the form and won't let you won't let you save the form if the email is not a valid email. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's kind of just sitting there, uh, I guess, waiting for more interest or somebody to, to um, fund it. So yeah, uh, emails are the bane of my existence right now. <laughs> Especially in a consortium because you know I get I get all the bounces and so I have to go in when I when I get those bounces, I have to double check the message on the bounce, you know, what you know, what was the problem, and then mark I have I go into the Patreon account and I'll restrict their account and give them a reason why. Uh, a specific reason why the email failed and uh you know said they need to resolve this or ch choose a different notification method so yeah i i, I like um it sounds like that chanel that you were uh, and christopher were talking about the same type of thing that michelle was saying you know use a different prefix um uh for the registration numbers at a library I worked at, they had pack reg was the prefix. So it was very clear to the staff, okay, this is not a normal library card number. It starts with pack reg. Um, uh, so anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know how well right. it would deal with uh, alpha, new, alpha characters. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way the, that library had chosen to do it. That's not necessarily the way to do it. That's just what they chose to do. And and another library that I worked for, we just chose not to use um, uh, Aspen's self-registration. We just used Koha's. We would basically, you'd click the link and it would go to Koha and do it that way. And mm -hmm. then there was a link that said, okay, click back here to go back to where you were. And it brought, brought him back into Aspen. But that was before... That was when Aspen was very new. I mean, we were the first library to go on Aspen, and so it was still pretty new and things like that. And so anyway, um, we just skirted around, you know, <laughs> our workaround was to just use Kohas, which is not which is not what you want to do. I understand that. So that's a tough one. I'm sorry. Emails are not fun. I, I know that. For a while there, we had to, we kept getting flagged for spam. And so uh, Bywater was getting flagged for spam. And then we had to change um, MX records and it was, it was a pain. I mean, they, they, Bywater walked us through it as much as they could, but. Yeah, there was a lot of changes email, with, email, email. with emails the past few years have been annoying and you know, we, we finally are kind of leveling out with with those issues uh mm -hmm. it sounds like uh you know we had uh we had uh jumped ship off of uh koha's built-in uh text messaging mm -hmm. uh email to text message uh uh, method because we were running certain to see more and more issues with that and so we mm -hmm. went over to twilio yeah that's a good, we good glad we did good um but the you know so much is changing in sms and email and it's just like sometimes it's hard to keep up with it that's what you're saying I feel like the smoothest notification method has been either the good old fashioned uh, uh, sending through the postal mail or uh, uh, telephone. It's kind of <laughs> sad that the the tried and true old methods, old technology works better than the uh, the newer stuff. 
Yeah. Well, go figure. It's it's just like wireless versus wired. You know, wired is always going to trump as far as reliability and speed and things like that than wireless is. Just always will. I and I always prefer. You know, even if it's a mouse, I'd prefer a wired mouse because I know it's always connected. But does anybody here use um, text to speech through Twilio or another uh, provider? Tell a, where where it speaks a message to your calls your patrons and speaks a message. Okay. Well, the yeah, the phone. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We're doing that. So you're not talking about staff calling. You're talking about robo calling. Correct. Okay, gotcha. And which service, which platform do you use for that? Twilio? Twilio, yeah. Yeah, okay. We use do Message like, B. Do you? Do you like either, but do you both of you like those? I like Twilio. It it was a learning curve uh, yes. in the beginning. Uh, oh. But uh, um, we initially, we signed up for it uh, to do the, the, the basic phone calls and uh, for the text messaging, but then I went in and I've uh, since tinkered around with the, the menuing system. So if somebody responds back to it, um, like if they replied back to the text, it would say, you know, this is not monitored, you know, contact us. So and so, and the phone number that calls out, if somebody were to call that back, actually has a menu system on it and mm. uh, redirects to the appropriate library depending on uh, what library they're with okay so they choose which library or it looks at their number and and uh it, they they choose which library they're yeah, with yeah i want to go to the free yeah forward them to the their phone number okay nice We're, we're hoping to move to message B soon. Um, I'm curious about your experience with it, you know? Oh, yeah, we like it. Detail. We like it a lot. We use it for email, voice, and SMS. Okay. Um, they have, they have, uh, they set up templates in, on their system. So you can go in and um, alter, like if the, the contact email changes or the phone number changes, you can just go in and fix it yourself. Um, you can uh, you can go in and see exactly what notices were sent to a given patron, what time they received them, if they open like if it's an email, nice. if they opened it, did they uh -huh. click on something? Um, makes it's great for when those patrons come in and swear you did not send me my whole pickup notice, and I can look and see exactly what happened. And it also shows the exact email that they were sent. It has representation of the email. Um, but uh, yeah, I highly recommend them. I know the Both. one thing that kind of made us a little bit disappointed with their preview is that it has to have like the consortial branding on the emails that go out. And our libraries are very independent from each other. And they said they can put the branding in the message, but it's still like they all have the same header no oh, matter which it. library they're going from. Yeah, we wanted a consortial header, so yeah, we didn't our run into patrons that. don't really realize that they're that our libraries are in a consortium most of the time. <laughs> so like, what's going on? Yeah, uh, but do they spell? do oh. they do know. I was gonna say they do know that they're part of the Black Hills Library Consortium because they all have overdrive access together. So maybe that would mm. help reinforce that. Yeah, we, we haven't had any issues that I know of, of of patrons being confused. We have the big logo of the consortium, and then at the beginning of the text of the message, there's the return address to whichever library it's coming from. Oh, cool. Because, yeah, it goes out by branch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you spell that? Is it message and then B or message B-E-E -E or? The, the latter, B-E-E. -E. I'm just looking it up. I'm going to put them in the chat. It's unique management. Oh, does gotcha. It, and they're okay. also the people who do the collections. Yeah. Gotcha. I, we've really loved their customer service. So we're hoping they'll be good for Message B too. Yeah. Their customer service has been great. Are you able to, on Message B, are you still able to see the notices that go out in the patron's account? Yes, you in you Koha. see it, but but what it if you open up the if you double click on it to see the notice, it's just um, it's just it's like Koha's internal mechanism that displays that for sending it to Message B. So and that's so, that's so the way it was for us too. We 
we would send out messages, but you just go into, co into their account in Koha and you look at the notifications. Because essentially what it does is it sends that notification and then Twilio is a text-to-speech engine, and, but, it's, but it's just reading the text to them, right? And so yeah. you just look at that. Yeah. But it doesn't, but in the case as, of, mm -hmm, go ahead. well, in the case of message B, it doesn't actually show the text that it sent out. It, oh, okay. shows, it shows the object ID for the, that message B instance that's cool though so so is it like a portal that you log into or no no, no yeah. you said it mm -hmm. was yeah you okay. they have their own portal that you log into and you can see that, everything that does sound good yeah i think we went with twilio because uh, at the last library was that because a it was cheaper and b it was uh there's a a plugin i think that kyle at bywater kyle hall had designed uh, that works pretty good and he they were really pushing it and so we were like okay we'll try it you know and and it worked out um but it was it was a good price but because I, I, I know that unique had one I, I can't remember I, and maybe that was before it was called message B I don't know but uh it, it sounded like a really compelling product too but it was also like 12 cents a message instead of you know half a cent per message or something you know it was it was more expensive but sounds like it might be worth it yeah, I don't really know how the price compares. That's right. Yeah. So Chanel, where uh, your Yava Pi mm -hmm. library? Where's that? That is in the mountains of Arizona, northwest okay. of Phoenix. Gotcha. Okay. I was wondering. I was thinking. Gosh, Yava Pi. That sounds familiar. My uh, parents-in-law live in uh, Wickenburg. Uh huh. And Just... so we've gone through there many times coming from Utah. I'm not, I'm not living in Utah now, but, but we did at the time. And so we'd go across there, yeah. I think. Wickenburg is partially in Yavapai and I'm guessing probably Maricopa. I don't know it's, what the other yeah. county is. Yeah, it is in Maricopa. Or at least they are because there's the, the, the Maricopa County Library, Aguila branch is down there. That, mm -hmm. That's their. That's their library branch because they actually aren't in Wickenburg. They're outside of Wickenburg and they're closer to Aguila. <laughs> anyway, that's way more than you wanted to know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a question for folks. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you guys gotten an upgrade date for Koha? We have. I'm getting yep. a little nervous because we have not. You haven't seen anything in your nope. uh, news nope. panel? I know we had a library delete our news before I saw it one time. So you might want to just oh. double check with Bywater. Or or you can go into news. Oh, did they actually delete it? Delete it? Or just, oh, dang. Okay. Well, well I'm really the only one that has access. So, and I don't, yeah. I know I didn't delete it. Yeah. That's ours is right. next, ours is next week, like next Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. I think ours is next week. Mm. It. You're special, Chanel. Yeah, well, we are. We are <laughs> I don't want to be special. <laughs> we're on 2311. So mm -hmm. we're like halfway upgraded mm -hmm. because we just mm -hmm. went live. They put us on 2311 rather than going back to mm -hmm. what, 2305. Mm -hmm. um, so we're like halfway upgraded. But yeah, just getting a bit nervous because I haven't seen anything about us going to 2405. I wonder if that might be why then it might take a different Path. set of steps or yeah. 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 I'll, I'll put in a ticket and find out. I had to put in a ticket too, to find out. Um, and they basically said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, what? This is not the typical, you know, my water behavior. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's not fun. Ours is uh, the first day of October. There you go. Oh, yours is coming up. Yeah, yeah. that is quick. Yep. Yeah, ours is on the 30th. Okay. Oh, even sooner. Yep. Do you do you know about clearing browser cache? That whole thing, Chanel. I know that you're supposed to do it. I don't know that anyone will do it. It's it's important because you'll go and click on a link and Koha will be like, oh, I can't find that address. And you're like, what? I clicked it. <laughs> and that's because it's trying to draw from cache. 
Okay. So, anyway, uh, it doesn't work anything on the system. It just, you get, you know, frantic right. staff like, oh no, it won't work. And you're like, just clear your cache and it'll work. Oh, okay. I know this from personal experience, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just assure them it doesn't break anything. If you don't do it, it just, you'll run into a trouble here and there. Most pages work, but some don't. So I just want to make sure you knew that. Um, as you're yeah. From, thank, uh, thanks how for new? the heads up. Yeah, for you're three welcome. months. Ooh, good for you. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Tell us about your library system. Please. Um, we have 58 libraries, which oh. are publics, academics, um, K-12s and specials. No kidding. Wow. That's great. And you're on Aspen too. That's and we're great. on Aspen. Yeah. Um, do you find it challenging to, I don't know if you design or make changes to Aspen, but I imagine that the, for instance, the academic libraries want a different flavor of Aspen than the public libraries and then the school libraries. And, and yeah, do you have a hard time with that or uh, um, is everybody just share the same Aspen no matter what? Well, we try very hard to to be consistent across the network so mm -hmm. that patrons because we have patrons that go between libraries all the time so we don't want mm -hmm. it to be a jarring experience but that said that said we do have a separate profile profile for every library and we do small changes mm -hmm. and and they do have access like they can rebrand if they want to change all the colors and everything on their instance they they can uh, if they so and, choose and they have access to it and they, yeah, and they have access yeah. to be able to do that. We don't see it very often though, because uh, usually they don't have people with the knowledge necessary to mess with mm -hmm. CSS. Um, I know that academic libraries probably want <clears throat> to turn off some features that Aspen is known for. Um, I, I haven't found Aspen is great for academic libraries because it makes a lot of assumptions that academic libraries don't want the those assumptions to be made. Um, uh, what I mean is if you put in Harry Potter, if you're in a public library, you want the Harry Potter books. You don't want some cookbook or some coloring book or something, right? And so Koha might bring up a coloring book when you know you want, you know, a Sorcerer's Stone or something like that. And, and Aspen knows that. So it brings up the Sorcerer's Stone, but, in an academic library, you want to know unbiased. You don't. You don't want Aspen to um, assume it knows what you're looking for. You want to see unbiased uh, search results, and so I think that there are some features that sometimes are turned off by ac academic libraries, like that kind of feature. Mm. Uh, so it doesn't assume, you know, that you're looking for one thing when you're like, no, I just want to see everything because I'm going to go through everything because I'm a researcher, you know. I, I don't know if it's because of the types of academics we have, but we, that hasn't come up as an issue. Okay. Um, I usually, I mean, usually it's somebody at school is searching for something fiction to read that they want to get transited from another library. So they're, they want the Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's mm -hmm. Stone type things to show up because that's mm -hmm. actually what they're after. At the academic libraries? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's the other thing, you know, some libraries uh, serve their patrons differently. Some academic libraries serve their patrons differently than others. So, well, we have, so we, we have, have one, we have one academic that is an aeronautical university. So they have very niche types of searches. Um, and then we have Prescott College, which is, which is an environmental mist type college. Um, and so again, I think they have very, you know, so it's not the type of thing where you're going to like University of Arizona and you've got people trying to write papers on Harry Potter and some influence that it's had where they actually are looking for nonfiction type stuff related. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I'm glad it's working out. Yeah, we're likely when we go on to Aspen it, to have kind of two flavors because we have publics and public libraries and academic libraries. Um, 
And uh, so we'll probably, I mean, each library will have their own profile if they want it, like you're saying, you know, in Yavapai. But um, we'll probably kind of have two different flavors there. Sounds like Linux. That's kind of what we want to have. If we, right now, our library is the only library in the consortium that uses Aspen. The rest of them don't but they're kind of interested and we're like, we want to keep ours how it is and let them have it however they want together. Yeah. And so we'll probably end up with kind of two separate aspirants for our consortium, which I'm not quite sure how that works, but Aspen seems to think that it's possible. So yeah. <laughs> I'm looking and it, into it. It does work. Um, there's some magic sauce that they use mm -hmm. um, because uh uh, I've seen it work in a consortium that I was in. You know, we we had three different Aspens for the three. That's different That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're 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 the big library, and then everybody else is real rural little libraries, and mm -hmm. but they're kind of interested in the the. They like how Aspen looks when they look at our site. They're like, "Wow, we want that!" But we, mm -hmm. you know, the the cost and stuff, we only just paid for it for ourselves and let them make the decision if they want to do it together. Right. That makes sense. Hello, Mike. Hey there. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And you? Good. Good. I'm Christopher. I'm not George. Uh, if you're used to seeing oh. George, he is out of town and uh, I volunteered to uh, chair the meeting for us oh there's your kitty hi kitty what's your kitty's name uh this is peanut <laughs> peanut i wonder why <laughs> just kidding you look pretty peanut all right uh so tell us about yourself a little bit um well actually uh well i'm from ocean state libraries in rhode island where the public library consortia um for the whole state nice and, and this is actually going to be my last kind of COHA meeting. Um, mm -hmm. I'll be leaving next week. So I just oh. wanted to pop in. Oh, yeah. well, hopefully it's good. I, I, I won't make any judgment, but hopefully mm -hmm. it's a good thing. So uh, best of luck on whatever life has for you next. Thanks yep. for saying hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a successor that's going to be uh, taking over for you that we'll see them um the 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 posting has been out and we've, they've gotten some applicants um well, we'll, we'll keep an so ear out i in a set in stone yeah it probably won't be for a while there was another position that they're kind of filling uh for collections management so mm -hmm. okay tell us a little bit so about little uh, busy oh okay tell us a little bit about uh your consortium you said ocean what ocean state libraries ocean state. Uh, we're neighbors uh we're kind of neighbors of clams uh they're okay. just next door <laughs> in massachusetts um very similar in size i don't know if michelle went into any detail there but um kind of do the same sort of thing we do the we support all the public libraries for technology um you know like div actual physical physical device like we do group orders like with dell and you know with um so basically they get like kind of like the same specs for for like yeah. pcs laptops and that sort of thing so you do um, the libraries you have we have 49 member live well i guess technically 50 member libraries in 72 locations wow yeah well you're in the right meeting yeah <laughs> I remember when we joined it in 2012, we were considered a big library group uh, or consortium. We were 28, but uh, it was big at the time. So it's mm -hmm. neat to see larger consortiums. Uh, yeah. To see how scalable Koha is. I know when we joined in 2015, we had. 12 libraries and it still felt like they were trying to figure out how to do consortiums so it's mm -hmm. nice that they've got you know so many of us that have been able to get it dialed in and you guys can come on pretty painlessly <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's still not quite there. Um, we have over 6,000 CERC rules and mm -hmm. it takes about 15 seconds for that page, for every page to load. So when mm -hmm. you need to go in and adjust or add CERC rules for every library you touch, you've got to wait another 15 seconds for the page to load. You're kidding me. That's, that's, that's why, I, you know, <laughs> when I go to the, I'm, I'm grateful for our consortium because it's like, you know, guys, we have to be on the same page because I'm not going to manage stuff like that. That's, that's crazy for me. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of rules. Having done circuit fine rules. Yes, that is a lot. <laughs> yeah, that was You're kind very of like brave a, Chanel. Sorry, go ahead. That was kind of like a little growing pain for us because, you know, in our previous system, which was Sierra, there was it. We didn't have to, because of the way like Aspen does like the whole grouping and by format. So we had to like exponentially expand our circ rules just to cover every iteration of a, like a book, large print book, board book, graphic novel, Blu-ray, and all that. And um, so that was kind of a little challenge. And yeah. And also another growing pain for us was um, Koha. I don't. I don't know if this is going to really be improved in the in the upgrade. But it, when it comes to the number of items attached to bibs, like it just crawled. Like we at our periodicals, like People Weekly was the. Um, was the bane of our existence, <laughs> you know, when we migrated, um, because there were thousands and thousands of items attached. And we used the item groups like we did in Sierra with volume records to group them into like issues. So patrons can, so it was more user friendly for the patron to place a hold on a group instead of a specific item. But like when it came time to like load a patron record that had an like a people weekly magazine checked out the record would either like never load really <laughs> like it would wow. never display it. And so we had like all those bib records with um like the hundreds of and thousands of items we had to like split out into separate years and then people ended up being split out even further into months wow so yeah, we just delete our, we only keep the past years of our magazines and then we delete everything after we get rid of it. And then we don't allow holds on ours. So the serials module works pretty good for us, except the numbering system gets out of whack if somebody does something like re arrives a issue that came in before the one before it and changes the number instead of marking the other one late, that it'll get all wonky. But we don't see that problem with like so many, you know, with it hanging, but I could imagine because even, mm. a, even with the amount that we do have on like people magazine is, <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you use the serials module in your consortium? We don't No, We, we never had in the past either. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, it didn't seem like we should add <laughs> that to our, our migration which we migrated not this past may the may before um so we're still kind of new on koha we like using it for arriving our new serials because it makes it pretty straightforward they just have to search for the serial enter the item information add it and it automatically numbers it for them as long as they don't they haven't done something that messes up the mm. numbering and we just have to go in like every year and fix that sometimes. The one thing that's a little weird is you have like, it tries to keep track of when your serials are expiring for you. And so that, you know, remind you to renew them, but we don't need that. And it really just makes it weirder. <laughs> <laughs> what What is the, what is the benefit of the serials? Because, you know, we don't use that, that either. And there was really never anything that that sold our catalogers on that so what is the what is the payoff for that I think that um 
I mean, there's probably other ways to easily add an item record to an item um, now with all the frameworks and stuff. But for me, it was that, it, you know, when they go to add, when they receive a serial, it has all the stuff filled in that they're supposed to do it. It automatically numbers it. All they have to do is add a barcode and a note and then add it. And it's just, it's put right onto the item record. And it kind of helps us kind keep track of like, hey, this item hasn't come in for a while. You can kind of see that. Um, it'll actually do claims too, if you want it to, like if you haven't received something after a certain time, it would send an email to the vendor saying, hmm. hey, we've never gotten this, but we don't use that part really either. And I could see how that would be very useful, like in an academic library. Yeah, I think that tons this, and tons this, and tons of serials. I think this is definitely built for an academic library. The only problem I can see is, like you said, having the back issues and how I don't know how it handles that for. Because mm. you delete them after a year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. we we hold we on to about two years. We also don't do like like uh, collective purchasing of periodicals they're all the libraries are direct so mm -hmm. i don't know how that would work in in a serials module in koha if everyone's ordering directly or through like some other subscription service for all their periodicals so, so basically our library in the spearfish library use the serials modules and the other libraries in our system don't and we have like say we have a bib record for people weekly um we just have a subscription that's attached to that record for us. And then Spearfish has a subscription attached to it as well. And then they go to their subscription and add the items using their subscription. And it keeps them, you know, they're in their library and that, and yeah, they can have their own vendor for that. And it's just attached to it. So it's the same bib record. Yes. They're it's just different items yeah. under different subscriptions. Sorry, what's that, Michelle? It's the same bit, but it just makes it a lot faster to load. It, so yeah. you're looking at the same record, but it's it's not loading all 1,000 people records. It's items. It's just loading your subscription, and, and it's a very clear, clean interface in the serials module. Uh, we went on before, Mike, and um, we were told, don't do it, don't do it. And I'm really upset that they told us not to use it because it works really well if it's mm. set up. It's just you need to take the time to do it. And they the need to take curve. the time. Yeah. 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 And, and it's like kind of like, oh, we don't do cereals, so we don't know how to help you. That's kind of like not good because it makes a big difference. It really helps. Um, and not all of our libraries are using it because they were so Turned like – um, turned off by by our our trainers at the time and they were saying don't use it don't use it and it's really because they didn't know how to use it but mm. once you start using it it works really well we ran into um, the same thing when we onboarded with koha the trainers were not selling cereals very well and you know they, they really didn't push it at all and we didn't get into it at all it would be nice. I, I don't know if there is anything out there that really walks people through the whole serials workflow. It would be it's nice to see that. Stick, I'd like to there? see it in action and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, show it to our group and say, hey, is this going to, you know, improve your workflow at all? Yeah, I wonder too, because there's like some settings that you can put in your subscription on like how many items to show the public and how many items to show your staff too so it like will only show the last eight issues if you want it to but i i haven't really played around with it to know if that is useful but it could possibly speed things up if you don't need to show all of the old ones to people i may have to talk george into ha us having an episode where we have somebody that's uh, doing serials uh, come on and walk us through that because I would like to see that. I would like to do that and, and have that as a video out there to so people are somebody more aware. somebody like Michelle and Juliet. 
<laughs> yeah. So when we trained three months ago, they didn't say anything against cereals, and we had a portion of our training that was devoted specifically to cereals. They're starting to grow up. That's awesome. Yeah, because that's they're, they're a little bit more confident in it. <laughs> Michelle, did you have cereals in Sierra? Yes. Okay. We had all, all of our cereals set up, and yeah, um, mm -hmm. I actually I converted all of our check-in records that said all of our holding statements, all the retention statements, those could not transfer to Koha. So I actually just like converted those into item records and then loaded them. Um, so they, because if you put in your retention statement in serials, it does not display to the public. And we want, the, because all of our libraries have different holdings statements, so like someone could keep their people for three months, some could keep it for six months. So they want that statement there. Um, I was able to put those in as item records. So those do display uh, to patrons. And we do allow holds on ours and they're, they're forced item level holds. So it does help with that. They don't use the same numbering patterns. So we don't group anything, um, but it the patrons seem to know, oh yeah, I, I want this issue. It, it seems to work pretty well for holds too. Hmm. Nice. Thank you. I I had no idea it was such a great resource. <laughs> Same type of thing, Christopher. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry that we had. You know, it wasn't really. Yeah, I, I mean, they they kind of said, "How much do you you know use?" periodicals and we're like man meh, meh. <laughs> and so they're like it's just not worth it you know um and we're like okay and we didn't use serials in the previous system so maybe you know we just set it up set them up as big record you know normal big records but who knows you know and well, i don't even i think know. the 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 plus for it you know the thing that's that's piquing my my interest is you know the 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 loading issue um, it sounds like it loads better in serials than it does if you're just going and uh, doing item ads mm -hmm. so I, I mean that sounds like a a win for that and um you know mike you were talking about having to split off uh, groups into different bibs because of of loading issues. Uh, when we initially uh, migrated, we we have we have archives of uh, the local newspaper. That's about mm -hmm. the the only collection that we really have a huge stockpile of in in our collection, and we had to break that off into a couple different bibs back in the day because things were loading after a certain point uh, they were they, they weren't loading right and, um mm -hmm. so i don't know since we migrated uh our koha to uh, elastic search and there's been several upgrades and improvements i don't know I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to try and merge those records and see is this going to behave now uh, or is it going to be you know just as bad as it was back in the day so that did you just get upgraded recently to the new double release no uh that's next week next week yep yeah we're getting upgraded um thursday night and then friday is my last day so it better go well because <laughs> <laughs> then it's somebody else's problem <laughs> well it was a pleasure working with you mike and you too michelle yeah, and you, all you guys, you guys have all been great. The whole Koha community and the library community. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I got to know you before you left. <laughs> I work out on the Oregon coast uh, on okay. the opposite side of the continent. <laughs> <laughs> so, Is George at, um, in Montreal? He is yeah. yeah so that's why i'm yeah. here yeah you're stuck with me sorry <laughs> all 
I like your little signs in the back, though. One says Bon Appetit, one says Yum, and one says Cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, was, you can't, um, they're like potato chips. Can't just have you can't just have one. And I have seven. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, huh? I'm gonna have to take a look at cereals again. I'm just trying to think of how much we. I mean, some of our libraries are have pretty good circulation of cereals and others are just dismal. Um, and of course, you know, the academics are a different boat altogether because they do, a lot of them don't have their cereals in Koha because they go through Flipster or something like that, you know, or they go through um, something else that uh, like EDS and I, I don't think EDS actually puts it any records in Koha. I, I think it, it searches directly through EBSCO EDS into EBSCO, you know, I, so it, it's kind of a different monkey with academic libraries too. That's, that's my understanding anyway, which is not perfect. But uh, this is good. I'm glad I got to do this. Something inside me said, you got to do this, Christopher. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I got scared. But I'm glad I did. Yeah. Good to see you again, Christopher. See you again, Christopher. Yeah, thank you. I'll catch up with you. All right. Well, it's uh, 10.02 Pacific. Uh, and so I think that uh, we should end. Is there anything else any, before we're done here? Nobody wants to talk about? No. Just good All to see right. everybody. Thank you. You too. Nice to meet you, Michelle and Mike. Good to see you again, Christopher. Uh, well, Take end care, the guys. recording. Just a second here. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.